grown up being able to see Pendle Hill from my back garden and there are lots and lots of things to know about the history of Pendle Hill. Plenty of people have written books and articles and made documentaries about the very famous Pendle Witches. The story of the witches has been passed down through the centuries. 342 years after the events of 1612, they were mentioned in Monex's directory of Middle Lancashire, which says, Four stones or Malkin Tower, a pleasant residence on the brow of Pendle Hill in this township, is the seat and property of William Mitchell, Esquire, whose ancestors were long possessed of this celebrated rendezvous of the witches of Pendle. Three and a half centuries after the trials, it was still a memorable part of local history. New Church in Pendle, or Goldshaw Booth as it was originally called, is directly linked to the story of the Pendle Witches. One of them, Elizabeth Southern, better known by the nickname Old Demdike, claimed to have met her familiar there, either a spirit or an animal companion. Allegedly, the two came together in the 1590s and another resident, John Hargreaves, was said to have fallen victim to one of the witch's curses. So this video is my take on it. From a family, social and maybe even Catholic history perspective. To begin it, I headed out to New Church in Pendle, but my first stop was at nearby Rough Lee, where I'd recently discovered that there was something interesting to see on the side of Black Bow Bar Road. So let us go there. So this is the Alice Nutter statue, which is, is pretty much life-size actually. Just over here we have got her name and it is said that the reason why she is stepping up like that is because it represents the way that she steps up onto the gallows. Unlike the other accused Pendle witches, Alice was from a comparatively wealthy family. She was from yeoman farming stock and they had land in the Pendle area. She was tried for witchcraft at Lancaster Castle on the 18th of August 1612 and two days later that was where she was hanged. So now for a bit of English history, in the language sense. How old is New Church's original name, Goldshaw Booth? According to the Victoria County History, published in 1911, in the year 1463 to 64, four men paid a total of eight pounds and six shillings and eight pence to rent places called Nether Goldshaw and over Goldshaw with either a property or some land, it's not clear, called the Crags. One of those men was named John Nutter. The Lancashire Archives also holds probate papers for a yeoman named James Hargreaves. Again it says he is from Goldshaw Booth and it's dated the 19th of December 
1546, so that's when his will was made and proved after he died. So that's the final weeks of the life of King Henry VIII. But what does Goldshaw Booth actually mean? Let's split the name into sections. Shaw is a wood, it's an old name for a wood. So in this case it may well be referring to Pendle Forest. Gold might just be self-explanatory. Is it the colour of the leaves in the trees? Are they golden? Are they yellowish? And Booth is a local name for the cattle farms that were in the area. They were also known as vaccaries. So that's how you assemble the name. And the parish registers tell us that between 1628 and 1967, 60 people with the surname Boothman were buried at New Church in Pendle. There are all sorts of ways that surnames can form, but to me it is logical that Boothman may just mean man who owns or works on a cattle farm. And if you have a look round the graveyard at uh, St Mary's Church, you will still find gravestones with the name Boothman on today. Did you spot, a few minutes ago, a reference to that other interesting word to do with cattle farms, vaccaries? You may perhaps be aware that the term vaccination, vaccination derives from the Latin word vacca, which actually just means cow. In the 1700s, Edward Jenner, a physician from Gloucestershire, in case you were wondering, realised that milkmaids who were exposed to cowpox through contact with the cattle never seemed to get smallpox. Having seized this idea, he experimentally injected matter from a cowpox pustule into a little boy. How the child felt about this is not recorded. And he then repeated the process some time later with the content of the smallpox mark just to see what would happen. I don't think we'll be allowed to do that today. Amazingly, the poor child, James Phipps was his name, let him do it the second time. I'm not sure I would have done. Jenner discovered that this process actually worked. And because he'd been looking at the connection with cowpox and smallpox, he decided to call the process a vaccination. That's where it comes from. So maybe that same Latin word may explain why these cattle farms around the Pendle area were also known as vaccaries. And peculiarly enough, the cattle connection does not stop there. First we've had the vaccaries, we've also had the Boothmans. There's another interesting surname that's going to come up now, another local one. Nutter. There are different explanations for this surname. It could be a person who was a scribe or a clerk from the Old English notaire, or it may also be a keeper of oxen, again coming from another Old English word, neat, meaning cattle, as in neat foot oil. You still sometimes hear references to that today. So two completely different origins for the word either are entirely possible. In this particular case with Pendle, I'm leaning towards the, uh, the cattle connection myself. In the decade either side of the witch trials, when you look through the indexes of wills that people were leaving, we also find that several local people named Nutter were making the last wills and testaments. Interesting to note there that people had quite different ways of describing where they lived 400 years ago. 
they didn't have house numbers and street names they had to rely on maybe the area within a village sometimes it may just be the village sometimes it may be a more unusual name that turns out to be something like a farm so when i was looking through these references to the nutters some of the names really confuse me riddle hallows i thought it had to be some kind of farm maybe a lost settlement and then i thought i'd try a different approach spellings weren't consistent in the past so i try to say the word out loud riddle hallows could it be that it's actually reedley hallows it's about a mile away from new church so it's not a long way away the victoria county history of lancashire offers a whole host of alternative spellings and interestingly it does note that in 1507 half of the 200 acre vaccary of Reedley Hallows was split between three different men Christopher Jackson, George Ormerod and would you believe it Ellis Nutter. By 1609 a Henry Nutter held land in the area and in 1662 so 50 years after the witch trials a different Ellis Nutter we hope was one of four tenants living in that area so the surname is coming up again and again in the same locality it does make complete sense that the local farming methods would have influenced more than one surname in the area just look there in the lower left corner you can see the initials ID that could actually be JD they sometimes used an I instead of a J back then 1653 and at the top is IH CG BS and a backwards N and R wonder who they were and also interesting is the sundial which has got a date on it 1718 believe it or not 200 years after that date stone was carved it too would be mentioned in Manex's directory of mid lancashire the church dedicated to saint mary bears upon its tower the date 1653 which is exactly what you see when you look at it today. If I've got this right, somewhere around here should be a very interesting grave this nutter grave is something that a lot of people apparently come to new church to see some people think that it's where alice nutter one of the pendle witches might have been buried after the trials of 1612 
But given that Alice was actually executed at Lancaster Castle, about 33 miles away, or 11 hours of constant walking, I'm not sure how likely it is that her body would have been brought all the way back to the new church area. Just on cue. <laughs> You'd obviously need some means of transport, and a horse, perhaps even a donkey. You'd need to feed your animal just the same as you'd want to put fuel in the car today. I think the chances are she's probably buried at Lancaster somewhere. It is worth noting that no burials at all are recorded for New Church between the 17th of March 1611 and the 7th of April 1617. So either nobody was bothering to keep a register or a few pages have gone missing there. Between 1599 and 1704, 38 people called Nutter were buried at New Church in Pendle. 15 males 21 females, and two who were simply described as infants. None of them were called Alice. Perhaps part of the register may have been taken away for the years around about the time before the witch trials came to a head, so that somebody could perhaps use it as evidence. They might be able to comb through it to find something incriminating. Then I had a look at some of the typical examples. As you can see from this particular entry, very, very typical of what's been included in the register. I'm not totally convinced that it would have furnished anybody doing any investigations with any useful information whatsoever. I think one of the sad things about the case of the Pendle Witches is that even age didn't actually protect any of the accused. At this point in time, people genuinely did believe in witchcraft. The monarch of the time, James VI, even wrote a book on the subject of witchcraft. He was really, really interested in it. The trial had taken place less than seven years after the foiled gunpowder plot and that in itself prompted James VI to really clamp down on Catholics. Which may perhaps be relevant. The law already expected everyone to attend Anglican Church every week. The new legislation that came in around 1606 just simply hammered it home. If you didn't take Anglican Communion at least once a year, you would be fined £60 for each month. If you were a Catholic or a man who's married to a Catholic woman, you couldn't practice medicine or the law. Certain professions are off limits to you. And legally speaking, the local magistrate had every right to come to your house to search your property for weapons or arms. They didn't need to have evidence, they just needed to have a suspicion really. But I recently came across an article in the Catholic Herald, which I will link to in the description box, that highlighted one part of the witch's story that is worth noting. Elizabeth Devis, or Device, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it, one of the accused, held some kind of gathering on Good Friday of 1612. Some people call it a feast, some people call it a meeting of witches. The guests included Alice Nutter. It didn't really help matters that Elizabeth's son James stole a sheep with which to feed the guests. But to the Anglicans of the neighbourhood, Lent didn't actually finish until Easter Sunday. So for them to be having this feast at a time of fasting and self-denial with two days to go doesn't really look very good. The whole event was viewed as being a bit godless, a bit heathen, very, very suspect. 
So this article from the Catholic Herald wonders whether maybe, just maybe, this gathering, this feast, is actually a smokescreen. Is it camouflage or a secret Catholic mass? Which it's logical that the Catholics of the neighbourhood may come together to take communion, to worship, under the guise of having a feast. Technically, if they did, it was an illegal religious gathering at that point. Perhaps they thought they would get into less trouble by claiming it to be a feast than they would if they admitted that it was a Catholic Mass. When Thomas Potts wrote The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster, which you can find as a free e-text, he stated that the matriarchs of the two families involved, or two of the families involved, Elizabeth Sutherlands, also known as Demdike, and Anne Whittle, otherwise known as Chattox, had reached the verge of the advanced age of 80. This is 1612. Now his account is a bit subjective, but if he was accurate about those ages, the two women would have probably been born in the early 1530s. So working on this theory then that they were in their 80s, they should have been around about 60 years old in the 1590s and their adult daughters could easily have been 30 at the same time. So I checked a list of recusants who were convicted between 1581 and 1592 but I couldn't actually find any Lancashire convictions involving people called Chattox, Redfern, Devis, Device, Nutter, Whittle or the Southern all names that are linked to the accused. But it is equally possible when you think about just how extensive those fines were that a lot of people who were inwardly loyal to the Catholic faith were also bright enough or just very, very attached to their money to go along to Anglican service just for a quiet life and just to avoid the risk of these really expensive fines. Another thing to bear in mind is that at this point in time Lancashire did have and continued to have a lot of landowners and high up people in society who were devoted to the Catholic faith. So of course it makes sense that people are far more concerned with keeping their landlord happy than following directions from this government in London who to them is just this faceless body that doesn't really mean anything. I mean London then it was so far away if you were in Lancashire I suppose it may well have been the other side of the world. Of course they're more interested in what the landlord thinks. <laughs> the church wardens for the year 1740. There's quite a few local names there. Uh, Hargreaves, Varley, Wilkinson, they definitely all come up. I'm sure a few of the others do too. That's quite interesting. Never seen that before. I wonder if it was originally supposed to be a window. It's a really, really unusual, very grand kind of plaque. On balance, I'd say that the theory that the Good Friday meeting was some sort of Catholic feast, maybe even a secret mass, might just have a bit of merit. This is the era of priest holes and secret Catholic services being held in the local squire's house under his protection where people aren't going to ask too many awkward questions because he's got a lot of money. So maybe that's why Alice Nutter was invited along to the Good Friday event, if we call it an event. If she is essentially part of the local gentry, her very presence at the gathering would give it some sort of legitimacy, some sort of respectability. And if she's sympathetic to the Catholic cause, that's going to be a great bonus too. When the witch trials were actually held, 
star witness for the prosecution was somebody whose evidence would simply not be admissible in any way, shape or form, I think, today. Her name was Janet Device, she was nine years old, and she gave evidence against her mother, Elizabeth, her brother, James, her sister, Alison, and Alice Nutter. She said, yes, she was there at the Good Friday feast. But what had the prosecutors actually asked Janet? If this feast was really a cover for a secret mass, did everybody take communion? In the Catholic faith, one of the key things about Catholic communion is the belief in transubstantiation. I know this because I was raised Catholic. <laughs> the bread and wine during the process of the communion rite is said to be transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Let's suppose a nine-year-old child who is without the benefit of modern schooling may or may not be able to read and write. If a nine-year-old child witnesses that, she's looking at this communion rite taking place. I think it totally possible that she misinterpreted it, misunderstood it, and perhaps genuinely believed that it was some kind of spell. As a social historian with an interest in Catholic records, I would love to investigate this theory further. But if I was to do that, I would want to see some evidence. If I could find someone named Bullcock, or Chattox, Devis, Device, Nutter, Redfern, Roby, Southern, or Whittle, being named in a list of convicted recusants, or even people that were just compelled to go to church um, after a bit of pressure was applied. I think something like that would add a lot of weight to the theory about the devilish gathering being a cover for a, a secret Catholic religious service. Because it is totally plausible to me that these godless people, if you like, weren't actually godless at all. Maybe they were just stubbornly clinging on to the old faith that their families had practised for years and this just wasn't acceptable in the relatively newly Protestant Britain. I have grown up facing Pendle Hill. I've just always known about the Pendle Witches. It's just part of local folklore, local history. It's one of those things that people know about this area. But what I'm not sure about is how widely known their story actually is. I don't know whether it has, for instance, travelled to other countries. The witch trials took place eight years before the Mayflower set sail. There, there were a few Lancashire families on the Mayflower, as I understand it, so perhaps that story could have come down through them as they made their way either to Plymouth or wherever they embarked. I would also like to know whether you have heard any interesting theories about the Pendle Witches. It's not totally clear, I think, from the story, as best you can put it together, whether or not there were any descendants of those who were accused and executed. Logic says that not all of the families were completely wiped out. There was only a handful of people really that did end up in Lancaster Castle and were executed there. So surely there has to be somebody out there. Somebody amongst their immediate family who did go on to have descendants of their own and maybe there are still some around today wherever they are in the world if you are a descendant of them please let me know